to, but start with, you know, in the more emerging artists. So I asked Edie um, to, to join me and talk about um, her collection, how she started collecting and, and give us a few tips also um, that we can you know, use to, to buy art for those who want to do that. So Edie is American and currently lives in uh, Vermont, but she's, you've been living here in the UK for a yes. number of years. Off and on for the past 10 years. Right. And has been buying art over the last... Oh, about, let's see. Buying art rather than collecting, and we'll talk about the distinction. Yes, we will, um, absolutely. 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. So a degree of experience. Four zero. Uh. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but I'm going to make, when we chat, I'm going to make a distinction, but my distinction yes. between yes. buying and collecting. Right. So I thought before we get on to that very important question, can you tell us what's in your collection today? Just give us a sense of what sort of, is it painting? Is it ah, sculpture? Sure. Okay. What sort of painters? What sort All of? Right. Um, it's a lot of variety because some of it's work that I've collected over years that I still want to live with. And some of it includes works that I've purchased in the last few years. My taste has changed, as I think everyone's does, even though there's always some consistency. Uh, what's in my collection now? Mostly abstract uh, in terms of the paintings, a lot of color. I do own a work by the artist in back of us, Yoram Chisholm, which I purchased from Alice in the spring, and I'm thrilled to have it on my walls. Uh, so a lot of abstract work, a lot of color. Um, I'm moving more into sculptural pieces. I'm okay. become very interested in contemporary ceramics and contemporary glass recently, and there's also a practical aspect to that. I don't have a lot of wall space. So if you buy paintings, you've got to have, in my opinion, you've got to have where to put them if you're buying to live with it rather than buying for investment. And that's something else that Alice and I will talk about. Um, so I'm running out of wall space. Uh, and I don't like my walls completely covered. Mm -hmm. um, I like to give the work space to breathe and, and to yeah. focus on it. So I'm moving more to smaller sculptural works that are easier in my circumstances, to display and to live with. Okay, good. Now, let's go to that question about buying art versus collecting art. So can you tell us what is, for you, the distinction between the two? Okay, I can talk about the distinction, but full disclosure, I don't live by these words all the time, okay? <laughs> and I... And I um, sometimes go back on, on what I'm going to say. And uh, the, for me, the distinction between buying and collecting is that buying um, it doesn't, it often doesn't have any theme or any rhyme or reason. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, oftentimes for me, it was, let's call some of my past purchases more of a high-end souvenir. And I don't use that term in a negative sense. Like I might be traveling in, in a place where I want to hold a memory of that place and of my experience of that place. So um, I might purchase something that for me is very evocative of that place and my time and my experience in it. So that's still more of buying art as opposed to collecting. Uh, for me, the distinction came when I became more interested in art as a hobby as an avocation as something that I did actively rather than just buy something when I'm on holiday. Um, it meant going to art fairs. Mm -hmm. It meant going to galleries. It meant going to artist studios. And when I was living, when I first started living abroad, that's when it really happened for me. It became for me an interesting way to get involved with the culture that I was in um, and understand the culture and also to meet other expats who had the same interests that I did. 
because I'm not the ladies who lunch type. And I wanted to do something more meaningful um, and more interesting and educational for me. And for me, that became art and specifically contemporary art. So that's my distinction. Collecting was, I guess the word I would use is more informed. Okay. Even though, and I'll honestly say, even though some of my purchases can still be rather impulsive um, well, and of the moment rather yes. than planned and studied. Yes, but if I'll, you know, think back to um, when you bought the work from Yoram, Yoram Tissin, um, there was something that resonated for you in the piece. And, and it, it seemed to me it was very much, you know, there was a piece that chimed with you at that moment in your life. Absolutely. And, and it was almost like to hold on to that. So I guess there's, in, in buying or collecting, there's having a line, having criteria, and we can come back to, to that. But there's also letting your heart speak. Absolutely. Absolutely. Decision. Absolutely. And I can't speak for everyone who collects art or buys art. This is just speaking for myself. I have to really really love what I'm getting for whatever reason, for whatever reason that it speaks to me and different things that I've collected speak to me for different reasons at different times, different purposes, but it has to speak to me because otherwise, why do I want to live with it? That's the criteria for me. And that's really interesting because just a moment ago, we were having a conversation. Lots of people will come to me and say, well, I want to buy art, but I'm scared of buying the wrong thing. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that question, buying the right thing or buying and not buying the wrong thing? Okay. Alice has <laughs> asked me that question before, and my first reaction was just kind of like a puzzled puppy look, like, what? What do you mean by that? Um, because I don't think about it that way, but I totally respect that a lot of people do. I don't think about it that way, not so much because I have so much confidence in my own decision-making, but I have confidence in what I like. And if I really like something, I'm not, a f and if I, if I really like something and I really want to live with it, then I have confidence in my decision. And the other thing I will say related to that is I'm not at a level that I'm purchasing for investment, air quotes, um, which for me, and it's a different meaning for other people, for me, it implies buying at a price level where you need to be, either need to be considering the investment potential or you are at such a level of means that you don't have to worry about. And you know, you can purchase multi-million dollar works without yeah. any consideration. And that's wonderful, but that's not where I'm at personally. Yeah. So I'm not buying for investment at all. At all. And, it's not you know, my it's criteria. It's to say that today, you know, we talk a lot about the financialization of the art world and totally. art becoming an asset class. So that you, you buy art in the same way as you might buy stocks and shares in companies. Um, and people do that to the extent that people buy uh, shares sh in a Picasso. A share of a painting. I've yes. read about this. And so to me, it, you know, but it, that game, that part of the market, you need to have a few millions to spare to Minim be in minimums. This. And, and to be able to invest it. And if it, you know, makes money, that's great. If it doesn't make money, it's like, it doesn't matter to you. And that bubble of the art market has exploded in the last few years where money was cheap. Uh, there was very low interest rates and that encouraged some sort of speculation. But this is, as I said, this is for people who are buying the Picassos and Basquias and so and this is not where we're at 
Um, it's not where most people are at. Most people. And let's face it, 95% of the art that will be purchased will not appreciate in value. 95%. So you can relax. And actually, <laughs> the way to think about things is to say that you buy the right way to buy an artwork is to buy what you love. It's, it's to buy, as Edie was saying, something that you want to wake up to, have on your wall and look at every day. And this is, you know, and so there's no uniform, there's no formula to say this is right, this is wrong, because what is right for you won't be right for you, because you will have completely different expectations most likely, maybe not. Um, but so I think setting aside this whole business of um, will it appreciate, will I lose money, just put that to one side and look at the piece. And the question to ask yourself is, do I want to look at this artwork every day? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then you can think about buying it. And so Let's say the answer is yes. You found a piece of art that you have fallen in love with. Then what? What happens? What do you do next? In a perfect world, yeah. <laughs> always a perfect world. In a perfect world, I think you need to wait. You need to ask a lot of questions. You need to ask the gallerist or the curator or the art advisor about the artist about the artist's background, look at other work they've made, um, including in the past to see if their style is consistent, is it changed, um, ask what their work is sold for. It's totally okay to ask if that's important to you, that's fine. Um, I don't always ask that. If I like something and I'm comfortable with the price, then I, I don't necessarily care, but I think it's an important thing to question ask. Yeah. Full disclosure, guilty as charged, I don't always ask. Um, but I think it's good to walk away and think about it for a little while. These, you know, these art fair frenzies where you go to an opening and there's already stickers on some of the works. You think, oh my God, I got here too late. You know, I'm here at the, at the opening and I'm already too late because half the work is sold. Well, that necessarily doesn't mean you're too late. It means that some of the works were very carefully sold to collectors that had expressed an interest in that artist even before the works yes. were hung. That happens sometimes. You know, if that happens all the time. It happens. It it happens. But, part know, of the art but, fair but, model. Yeah, but that's fine. And that happens in a gallery opening too. There's nothing wrong with yeah. that. And you can wait and you can say, you know, I really like this artist's work the ones that I'm interested in, maybe those have sold, or maybe I can't afford the ones I want. So you express an interest. You express an interest to the curator or the gallerist. And you say, look, I'd, I'd like to be advised when you have other paintings mm -hmm. from this artist. Or once I saw a, a very large oil painting that's now hanging in my house and was hanging in my flat in London for years before I shipped it back to the States. Um, I once saw this artist's work in a small show in a museum. So this is a, this is a really good story because I learned an important lesson from it that I want to share with others. And I was blown away. It was a solo show, huge, abstract, very colorful oils in this very, not that large square room. And I happened to be the only person in there at that time. And I was just struck by the energy. And there was obviously no price information because this was a small museum. And I went, okay, let's look this up. So I had Wi-Fi. I sat down on a bench and I Googled uh, this artist's name and I found that he was listed on Artsy. So I looked him up, I read about him on Artsy and I was like, okay, who, who's representing this artist? So I looked up who's representing this artist and I'm, my goal was not just to learn about the artist, complete disclosure, was to find out can I afford <laughs> to own yeah. any of these? I'm like, or as I like to say in, in my in my circle, how many zeros? <laughs> because if it's a lot of zeros, I just like, okay, well, that's lovely. It's a museum. I can appreciate them, but I'm not going to have this on my wall. So I was able to learn enough online to say, okay, I can afford one of these. So then the question became, how do I see more? 
And how do I see if this artist paints anything that's of a size that I could have in my home because the works of the show were huge. So at that point, I didn't know, does he ever paint anything smaller that I could conceivably have at home? And the answer was yes, because I reached out to the gallery that represented this artist. And um, she said, next time you're in town, come and look. Uh, so the next, it was a few months later, I was back in that country with my now ex-husband and we were able to go to the gallery and see works. And there was one that I really loved that was at a size that was conceivable, but I had just moved from one flat to another. I had no idea of the dimensions of the walls. Like I had no idea what would fit. And the gallerist was amazing. And I've learned that this is what a good gallerist will do. I'm going to hold this for you. When you go home, you measure your walls, you send me photos, and we'll see if it will even fit. Because if it doesn't fit, like, you know, yeah. hello, goodbye, and that's fine. And I went home, measured my walls, sent her photos. Not only did she determine that it could fit, she photoshopped the painting onto one of my walls and sent it to me so I it. could see. And, and, that di and that did it. And that did it. And the painting was shipped to me in, in London. It had to be taken yeah, off the yeah. stretchers and rolled to be yeah, shipped because yeah. of the cost. It was yeah, so yeah, big. Yeah. And then re-stretched here and then hung. And then it was shipped to the States over the summer. And now it's hanging in my home in the U.S. Amazing. But Tell us the name of the artist because I'm, I'm dying. Uh, it's a Tel Aviv-based painter named Elad Kapler. Wow. I will certainly and, recommend Yeah, and yes. it's really bold, very colorful, abstract works, works for the most part. Okay. And I've since seen his work in a few hotel collections. Okay. And his work has, not why I buy, full disclosure, not at all. Um, his work has gone up in price enough, from, to my knowledge, in the five years since I bought this particular painting that he's probably not affordable for me anymore. But you, know, you might say, oh, you made a good investment, but I don't really care because I'm not planning on selling it. I love it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell it unless I had dire circumstances and had to, but again, we are not talking a Basquiat or a Jeff Koons. We're not yeah. talking the level of an artist where there's like a market and an auction market for mm. the works. But again, that's not why I'm buying. It's not my level. So it's yeah. fine. The other thing, by the way, that a gallerist will do um, is if you're considering buying a painting and you're in the same city, they will let you have the painting, put it on, you know, try it at home and you know it's worth asking because i've done it absolutely and honestly it's the best way to make a sale because uh once you have it at home and it sort of fits it's very hard to give it back so um absolutely so then and and but That's it's also a very common in the in the biz and, it, and it's happened this. to me as well and I once and this is back in the states i was between two works and I really yeah. couldn't decide between the two. And the gallerist said, I'm going to bring both of them to your home mm -hmm. and my particular wall area in mine. Yeah. Let's take both of them to your house. Let's, let's, let's see which one respond, you respond to more yeah. in your home, which one, some people would turn their noses up at this comment, but which one looks better in your home? Because let's face it, I'm not buying to decorate my home, my home, but I want it to look good and I don't want it to necessarily clash and fight with other things on the opposite walls. Yeah. Yeah. So two paintings were brought to my house and I could kind of you know, put one up, put the other one up and see which one I responded yeah. to yeah. in my space. Yeah, and I've done, I mean, very recently I've done exactly that where I took three paintings actually to, to a collector who was considering um, and she picked, she picked one. So, you know, it, it's... So don't be just, afraid to ask. Exactly. There is so much that you can ask of a, of a gallerist. You, you shouldn't be scared. A gallerist or an agent or, or even 
you might meet an artist and you like their work and you might have a conversation with them and they might do it, they will most likely do exactly the same and that leads me on to another question which is do you do you have to meet the artist oh, that you're question. going to buy do you have to you know have had interactions with them or or actually the opposite do you not want to have any any contact with them before buying that's a really good question i love when i can meet the artist and oftentimes and this has been true of, of more sculptural works particularly because i have a real interest in ceramics and emerging ceramic artists in london and i've had the good fortune to meet a lot of artists and go to their studios oftentimes in those cases if i like the artist and i like what they're doing and i like the piece itself for me it's almost as if i'm buying into their vision i'm mm -hmm. investing in them and i'm being able to take a little piece of them and their vision home with me to own and to right. live with so in that sense i love meeting yes. the artist but oftentimes you don't have the opportunity to or it, it just doesn't work out and that's not necessarily for me a negative but the positive for me is if either before i buy something or after i've bought a work to meet the artist um so this elad copler in tel aviv i have missed the opportunity to meet him on a couple of occasions uh through the gallery when he's been either he was in the US for a residency and it didn't work out for me to go to where his residency was and then there was a time when I was in Israel and it just didn't work out schedule wise for me to meet him but that's one of my goals I was looking forward to meeting Yoram in London this week yeah. sadly he he couldn't join this this uh, show and this opportunity but I was really looking forward to meeting nice. him in person um so I think it's for me it's a little bit of both but okay. when i can meet the artist um it's really special and particularly when i can go to a studio so that's something else i really enjoy yes. doing there was another time where i was traveling and i was on an art tour and i was in an artist studio so the work was not what i would normally get because it was not abstract mm -hmm. i would say they were extra ex abstracted landscapes in a way but they were very much representational but i liked him so much and i yeah. really felt so good in his studio and, and the way he spoke about himself and his background and his art the last day of this art tour they actually you know the day after the art tour ended he was finishing a solo show and i got to go to that solo show at a gallery and everything was sold and i was mm. thinking i was looking around at the body of his work in the gallery and thinking oh you know what this isn't really what i'm drawn to but i like it enough that if there were something of, of his work that i would like to live with i think i would buy something and i said to one of the gallery assistants oh i guess i came too late it looks like everything except for really big ones which i didn't have room for looks like everything sold she said well no not exactly come with me mm. <laughs> and there was like a <laughs> secret room not a secret room but like like a storeroom which i have learned that most galleries okay. have the well, yes, but i didn't know that before <laughs> i started collecting that there's always a closet or a storeroom and not everything is on the walls yeah so she was able to take me back into this room where there were some works mostly smaller ones mm -hmm, that they mm -hmm. chose not to hang cuz the gallery they're in business to make money let's be honest they're in business to sell art to help support the artists and support themselves so if they have a limited amount of space and they have larger works and smaller works and they see that the larger works are selling why would they give that limited amount of wall space over to smaller ones yeah. to be totally honest so she had some smaller works that were not in the gallery and one of them is now hanging in my bedroom because very good I, yeah. well i think this is um secret number i don't <laughs> know which number just we're on you have to learn no one tells you there is a secret room in all of the galleries <laughs> if you go to freeze right now you will have 
a, a little room, a back door for all of the big stands, and they will have some some works that they're holding back. That is, as Edie says, it might be smaller, it might be slightly different, but it's it's stock, extra stock. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something you just need to ask. You you need to say, do you have you know different works, smaller works, other works, and most of the times they will they will have. Um, so yeah, that yes. was that was a big aha moment for me because yes. starting out, I had no idea. Yes, I had, it happened to me yesterday at an art fair with a friend. She was particularly interested in this one photographer. This friend collects contemporary photography, and she has a very very well trained eye. She's worked in art as a career, so she knows what she's looking at. Totally different tastes than mine. But one of the first questions she asked, and it was at a booth at a small art fair this weekend, and she said, is there anything else that you have? And the gallery was from Paris, so everything had been shipped. So is there anything else you have of this artist that's not on the wall? And he came out with a few other small photos that he just <laughs> didn't have room to hang yeah. and laid them all out on yeah. a table for her to choose from. And did she? And she did. She did. There you go. She found exactly mm -hmm. what she wanted. She was very happy that she wanted to something from this particular artist. And but the first thing she asked was, "Is this all there is of this size work from this thing from this artist?" So there you go. So I'm just going to give you notice. If you have questions, think of questions. I'll you know I really want to encourage you to to ask Edie. Um, I'm going to ask. One more, and then I'm going to turn to you. Um, what advice would you give your young collecting self? Oh, that's a good question. My young, okay. Well, I didn't collect when I was that young, but if I were younger, I would have learned more. And learning doesn't necessarily mean taking courses. Um, I would have gone to art fairs sooner than I started going to art fairs. I, might, I came to this later in life. I would have gone to more galleries. Even the blue chip, the, the most well-known of the blue chip Mayfair galleries, I learned pretty early on here, that particularly in the middle of the week when they're not that busy, just go in. Treat it like a museum that happens to be a, a solo show, in particular, yeah. of a really well-known artist. Treat it as a solo exhibit in a museum that just happens to be free and not exactly. have an entry fee. It's free. <laughs> and most of the gallery assistants don't have a lot to do when there's no one in there, and they're really happy to have a chat. And they're not as stuffy as I would have thought. Even in a you know in a Hauser and Wurtz in a in a row pack in like the, the the biggest and best of the galleries, so that was that's one piece of advice. Um, read, subscribe to some of the, you know artsy and art newspaper and, and like you don't have to pay for them. Some of the really good ones are just you know free newsletters. Um, there's something in London I can't think of the name of it off the top of my tongue, but it's basically an art list. And every week, mm, this guy mm. sends out like a list of like what the openings are at the galleries. And he does yeah. it by area. So let's say, well, you know, you're going to brunch in Shoreditch one day. Well, he'll like say, like, what's opening in Shoreditch? So while you're there, take a half an hour and pop into one or two of the galleries. Just learn. The other thing that I came to really late, um, and I'm not a social media person at all, mm. um, I have learned how important Instagram in particular has been for art and artists. So I will read about an artist and it will often have their Instagram handle and I'll click on it and it'll click me through to their their Instagram feed and I'll click follow. I'll scroll through, oh, this is an artist I'd like to see more of their work. They could be anywhere. I mean, I follow this artist in Poland. I follow this other artist in Denmark just because I read about them once in an article. And I went, oh, I like this work. Am I ever gonna buy it? Probably not. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. I'm just learning about art and artists in other parts of the world. And someday, who knows, that artist might be showing at an art fair in London. And you're going to go, oh, I know that artist. 
Yes. So uh, to me, yeah. that's the advice I would give is just learn and, and yeah. make it a, a, a bit of a hobby. Make it your thing to read and go to art fairs. And it doesn't have to be freeze. Freeze is really expensive. I love freeze. I was there two days ago. But there's a lot of art fairs in London that aren't costly, yeah. Yeah. that don't have time tickets. And you can just walk in yep. and wander and, you know, take pictures. They let you take photos or, you know, follow those artists on Instagram if you mm -hmm. like them and just, just kind of get a feel for what you like, what you don't like. And that's the best advice I think I can give to someone who's just starting out and really curious. Good. I'm going to turn to the audience and ask any, any questions. I have a question. Um, you said you began with the difference between like buying and collecting. And I was wondering uh, how did collecting begin for you? Was that when you discovered you had a special passion for abstract art? Or was it when you just naturally became more knowledgeable about it? Or was it something very conscious for you about what kind of art you wanted to live with? I was just fascinated by that. Oh, OK. Good question. Um, for me, the timing of the change between buying and collecting was very specifically related to a particular point in my life. Um, I was living in Asia, Shanghai specifically, uh, because of my ex-husband's job. And I didn't particularly like it. Nothing, it wasn't Shanghai's fault, it was more my fault. I was on the older end of the English-speaking expat spectrum. And um, expat, I didn't speak the language, so that was a blockade in and of itself. Um, expat life there really didn't suit me, but I was determined to make it work. And one of the ways that I made it work was also the way that I came to understand and learn more about Chinese contemporary culture was through art. So I joined a few expat organizations and clubs. And again, most of what they did was not of interest to me, but what I discovered was were the art groups, that's my phone, we're going to ignore it, um, were the art groups. Um, and there were, you know, English language, art tours, gallery tours, studio tours. I met some artists. I met some English speaking gallerists. I apologize, people are relentless. Um, and I think that's WhatsApp and it just keeps going. Um, and that was for me both my way in to understanding the culture that I was living in. And it was also my way to appreciate the art of the moment there. And we were living in a serviced flat that was lovely, but quite generic, but we were allowed to hang art. We had like, had like museum, like the- the Oh, those railings. The rails, the museum rails, because they realized yeah. some people were going to be there longer term, as a lot of Western yeah. expats in Asia do. They choose to live in a service property rather than buy a, a flat or rent a flat and have to furnish it themselves. And we had museum rails. And then we had some spaces where I could literally take That's the amazing. painting and just yeah. like prop it against the wall on a console. And we went to some of the art fairs there. And... Um, started purchasing Chinese contemporary art. So that was, I think for me, the beginning of my head switch from just buying to collecting. You. You're welcome. Yes. And it's such a nice way to get into a different culture as well. Absolutely. To, and I would to understand that the, the contemporary art scene, because you see, you know, for me, that something equivalent is when I go and visit um, graduation shows. Absolutely. And every year at that time of year, which is June, July, you Another great find piece out, of advice, go to graduation shows. Go to graduation, absolutely. And you find out what's in the psyche of very young emerging contemporary artists, what are the big themes, what are, you know, what's evolving. And between us, you can also pick up some great pieces direct from the artist at a very good prices. But it okay. just, it gives you a way into that culture. And again, you're meeting the artist. If you're going to a graduate show, you're meeting the artists. 
And that to me is, is really exciting. And again, wandering around, you get a sense, you just get a sense of what's going on amongst artists who are studying art right now. And I think it's really, really mm. inspiring and exciting. And you might not like any of it. That's yeah. okay. Cause yeah. that's also part of honing your own, your own confidence and your own sense of taste. You might not like what you see. And I go to people's homes who are like furious collectors and they have budgets far, far greater than mine, than mine will ever be. But that's okay because you're learning. And I go, I've gone to some and I'm like, okay, this is, I, I know that I know who that artist is and I know that that costs in the millions, but I, I wouldn't want to live with that. And that's okay. It's all right <laughs> to say, I appreciate that that's a very valuable work of art. But it's not my taste. It's not my style. It's not something that I would yeah. choose to look at sitting in my home. Yeah. But that's and perfectly you, okay. And you have to meet your taste in a way, you know, through that process of discovery. It's not necessarily immediately obvious to you what it is that you like or you don't like. It's that training of your eye, which is very, very important for you to start thinking, okay, actually, I like abstract no i like more figurative or i like landscapes or i'd rather have people um you know pictures of people or or sculpture or you know it's more color you know that i respond to but actually this is a process of of discovering your own your own taste and 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 your own inclination um any other questions Yes, okay. so, um, so, Edie, I, I lived in Hong Kong for my husband's job as well. And um, in Hong Kong, particular, I know Hong Kong and Shanghai are a bit different, but Hong Kong, in particular, was like Art Basel, Basel was everyone was in for. Like, I've been to Art Basel, <laughs> Hong Kong, okay, so I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Everyone seems to be in for investment and more kind of money focused. But how did, do you have like favorite city, particular city in the world? Or how do you compare Asia and um, Europe, US? Okay. Or that kind of attitude? That's a really art? good, that's a really good question. Even as an American, I have to say, because I've hardly lived in the US for the past 10 years, I would say my experience with art in the US, particularly the major American cities, is the least. That's where I know the absolute least. So full, dis full disclosure, I know very, very little about the art scene, so to speak, in the US, even though I read about galleries and shows and fairs, that's not been a part of my life. So I can speak best to London and to Asia. Uh, interesting in Asia, and the, the years that I lived in Shanghai were 2014 to 2018, and then going back and forth, until COVID. Um, it was very interesting to me because the market for contemporary emerging Chinese artists was really, in my very unprofessional opinion, extremely overheated at that time because I would go on gallery tours and I would look at a work, this was mostly paintings, but also other, other media by an emerging young, Chinese artist at a gallery. And out of curiosity, well, I would just ask price range. And it would be the equivalent of 100,000 pounds. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a young artist, no provenance, really, really starting out. And that's the price point. Mm. And in my mind, this is when I was just beginning my art learning journey thinking, is this an overheated market? Is this a gallery taking a gamble on, and like has so much confidence in this artist's value? Or is this, to be perfectly blunt, a lot of new money chasing art and needing to spend that money on something other than clothes and designer bags? And I wasn't sure, but I think it was a lot of the latter uh, at that time. That didn't mean that there wasn't emerging Chinese art that was more affordable and that we could buy. 
Um, but the first, the first times I, I started going on these gallery tours, I was blown away. And these were really, really young artists. I have since seen the same thing in London. Yeah. I have gone to some gallery shows, a young artist. I did not like, I'm picturing one show. I did not like the work. It was not to my taste at all. Um, young artist, literally just graduating from art school in London early 20s, so not just young, young and emerging. Yeah. No history, no provenance, and the works were selling for well over 100,000 <gasps> pounds. And they were selling. And, yeah. they were, and, and the gallers was really frank with me. Oh no, almost all of this is sold. Oh, yeah. You know, aside from the fact that it wasn't to my taste, I was thinking, you've got to be kidding. Is that just a lot of money yeah. looking for something to spend it on? And I, I didn't know, but I suspected that that was a piece of it. But in terms of differences, and I think it's also a cultural difference, um, you know, in Hong Kong or in Shanghai or in Art Basel and the satellite fairs, which I'll say something about, um, you, the collectors and the people were coming mostly from Asia and Australia and less from Europe. You know, even years ago when I went to Art Basel in Hong Kong. So it is a different market. Um, London, just more global, period. I mean, I don't know enough about the New York market or the Miami market to say this, but I suspect that in terms of the collector, the collecting public that comes and views these art fairs, I don't think it's as global as London. I think London is still probably the most global market in terms of who comes here, both the galleries and the buyers. That's, but we will let the expert uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong. No, I think you're absolutely right that there's this phenomenon with ultra contemporary artists. So this is the, the, how they're called, these so super emerging artists that galleries might pick up and start building up like the next big thing. And all of a sudden you have Gagosian who is putting forward an artist that you've never heard of before Brand and new. people are fighting over to, to get a piece of. And as I said earlier, there was a lot of speculation in the art market for this ultra contemporary tranche. But this is the tranche that right now, because of the change in the economy and interest rates, is starting to suffer. And as an artist, once you've, you've hit a certain price, the worst thing that can happen to oh, you oh, is if it goes down. Because then it, it's the same as um, an asset. So people will start selling because they perceive that the market doesn't want that anymore. And then the prices will fall in value. So there is real danger to reach an apex for the artist. Soon for the Absolutely. artist, because then if the prices doesn't hold, they're sort of it's like big mark against them, and people will turn away. Um, so it's it, it it is an issue, and the and the whole issue of pricing um, in art is a is a dark art. Mm. So that requires a whole different conversation. And I'm, I'm sure I'll do an interview um, oh, on pricing. this because it, it's fascinating. But there is this sort of, there, there has been this bubble. I think it's, uh, it's been hit um, because of the turn in the economy. But again, even at £100,000 plus, I would not buy art for investment because no. this market is very That's not likely an investment to, level. No. to shift. You know, investment, you're, you've got to be in the millions. And if you want to invest in art seriously, you're, you know, it's Picasso. That will not lose his value, his work. But, uh, you know, there are very, very few. Anyway, enough said about, yeah. about this. Um, don't I, buy for investment. If you walk don't. away with anything from <laughs> yes. this talk, Alice and I are going to don't buy unless you're at that rarefied level, the, the 0.001%. Don't buy for investment. And I would say even for somebody who's investing, please love it. Please, yeah. please love what you're buying. It's not shares. I mean, it's, it's, yes. it's something that someone created. Um, so, yes. So we've got like three tips. Don't buy for investment. Buy because you love it. 
and um, do your research. You know, go out, find out what you like, you know, look at websites, you know, do a bit of, of research because this way you will buy the piece that you really love. And you've got a little postcard with our top tips, um, which are pretty much that, <laughs> spot on. And um, I didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you very much, Edie, for oh, being here. We have another question. Do we have Ooh, time for one more? Sorry. Of yeah. course, of course. Um, what point is enough? So you've been doing this for 40 years. Um, if you're not doing it... But I haven't been collecting, air quotes, for 40 years. So that, that's... How long have you been collecting for? In earnest, where I think I changed from a buyer yeah. to a collector was probably in the last 10 years. Okay, so 10 years. But I've had a lot of art even before that, so I already had art. Right. So but when is not, enough? Yeah, yeah. So if it's never. Not the answer is never. <laughs> never. Really? If you really, really, really love art, I don't think you get to the point where it's like, I have enough art. Um, at least for me. Mm -hmm. I would say, for me, it's now more about being more careful mm -hmm. and maybe spending more, not less, counterintuitively. Uh, but waiting, like I'm, I'm already thinking for myself uh, because my personal circumstances have changed recently uh, and not just moving back to the US. It's like, I'm thinking about in my mind, uh, giving myself a budget and like looking at certain kinds of art and saying, I'm really attracted to this type of art and I want to learn more about it. And in the next year or two or three, I want to buy a piece of this type of art, um, but I don't know what that is yet. So for me, I already know what the type is likely to be because I'm very drawn to textiles. And there's a lot of artists using fabric and textile and even painting where they've sewn or embroidered yeah. onto mm. a painted canvas. And I've always enjoyed collage and mixed media. So, which is one of the things that I enjoyed about the work from Yoram that I purchased because it had a mixed media element. It had a textural quality to it. The one that I bought was painted on jute and it had a wrinkle and a fold in the jute, which I really liked. Um, so I'm really, in, I'm finding myself drawn to the textile works. I'm actually going to the British textile biennial in two weeks. I have no idea what that is, but I was invited. And I'm like, okay, that sounds like a good place to learn. And I am considering that the next art that I buy will be um, some kind of textile-based work. And I don't know what that is yet. 